Can I do it? Praise God. Hallelujah. He's that Tony. The Lord bless you. The Lord lift you. The Lord bless you. That was a good Amen. song. And I thank God for your life. It's a new release. I remember when I spoke to you in Texas that you will come on board. I saw the excitement in you. And I know you're going places in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Lord will bless you and your family. Your ministry will never go down in the name of Jesus Christ. And eventually, your ministry and yourself, you go into the roots. And you are going to tap into the benefits and the blessings of the living God. And heaven will lift your head above in the name of Jesus. Thank you very much for that good, wonderful thing in the name of Jesus. Well, viewers, we thank God for that piece of worship in the name of Jesus. And I know our house is ready to get something into our spirit, man. And I know my good friend, uh, Reverend Greg Alabi, is post ready. I remember 30 something years ago, we've been together, and he's a man of grace, a man of humility, a man that knows the, the mind of God, a man that flows in the power of the Spirit. I, I, I welcome you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, it's, it's, it's something we are missing you in Nigeria. And I know in the name of Jesus Christ, that grace that is on you will never diminish in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, I know you are loaded, ready to give to us. That with the Lord is placed in your heart, in your mind concerning going back to the root. And we know, as we have discussed, what we are seeing right now all over the place, not only in Nigeria, you are tasting it right there in Canada. And for what we are seeing in this pandemic period, a pandemic thing we're having around, there's nothing coming from the church that will make people to come to us and say, we are the solution. And I know by the grace of God, the Lord will use you to bless hearts and make us ready to go back and go on our knees and receive that exact thing God wants us to do so that the church may be relevant again. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord will use you. Reverend Greg Alavi, I want you to join hands with me to welcome him on board. The Lord bless you, sir. You are welcome. Thank you. And I want to give God thanks and praise for the opportunity that you've offered me. And I want to welcome everybody to this great session. I trust God that God is going to bless us. And I also trust God that God will use you to bring some value to us and to the people watching. I want to also use the opportunity to greet my good friend, Reverend Victor Amoso. It's been a while I last heard from you. I love you a lot, but we're just busy. Eh? And um, it's good to hear from you. Uh, I'd just like to maximize the opportunity. All protocols observed, all oversights, please. My apologies. I am bivocational, meaning that I have a secular job and work full time for the Lord. That's the way I describe myself. <laughs> yeah, <we're good. laughs> yes, so uh, I know how it feels. I pastored for 16 years before, and I run an itinerary ministry and I preach every day now on radio. And God has given me the opportunity to be about five different radio stations. And it's I really know the pool that full-time ministers go through. But I said all that about myself to make a point, not to tell you I'm a great person, but to make a point. Sometimes when you're going through mass production because of volume of demand, if you are not careful, quality will be, will be compromised. And that's what we are likely facing right now in the body of Christ, where we see a lot of people coming to Jesus and we don't get the quality of Christians, workers and ministers that we expect because there's a lot of mass production going and there is no quality control and therefore there's no quality assurance. And when there's no quality control and quality assurance, you are likely going to get compromise of qualities. And when quality is compromised, performance will always be at risk. Now, I said all that because one of the projects that I'm looking after right now 
it's about 150 something million, 157 million dollar project. And senior management asked my regional manager to ask me to add to my portfolio another project that's about $60 million that I look after. And I have learned something in life. If God wants to increase you, he will first stretch you. The demand is much, but I went today with a senior project manager to look at what was going on. And it has a direct bearing to back to the roots. The architectural drawings and the engineering drawings don't match up with the realities we have on ground. And so that gap, to correct that gap for just one of the sections of the project is needing over $90,000 minus man hours just for materials to correct an oversight that was not captured in the drawings. That in the reality, when that construction work was going to be done, it didn't matter. So what's the relevance of what I'm saying about my secular job with the topic here? Some time ago, I was in Benin City to preach. And I was put in a hotel alongside with other ministers. And on the post, I was another man of God from Port Harcourt, who I've heard his name, never met him before. So I walked to his room to knock on the door to say hi. They wouldn't let me go in. His bodyguards, ministers with dark glasses everywhere. You can't see the man of God. If you want counseling, wait until after the program. You will see the man of God after the program. They will give you an appointment to see him. I just shook my head. I said, when did we become this way? And so I had to introduce myself to these young people. And then the man of God heard from inside and said, oh, 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 oh I'm sorry, let him in, let him in. Oh, man of God from Lagos, how are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. And they received me in. And then he was blaming me for not introducing myself as a reverend doctor. Because I walked up to them and said, my name is Greg Alabi. And they said, oh, you can't see the man of God. How did we get here? How did we get here? How did people back in the day who call Brother Paul Ginodu, Brother Yemia Yodili, and now a man of God got insulted that an invitation letter to him was not properly addressed, that they call him evangelist so-and-so and not Reverend Dr. So-and-so. He said they should return it and readdress it properly before giving it to him. How did we get here? Now, I'll take us to scriptures to help us to see that for us to understand, before we go back to the roots, for us to understand the degree of degeneration, let us review the quality of what we are getting based on the things we set out to produce, the things we thought we would get when we were doing our drawings, when we were working on the drawing boards, when we were working and training people, and now see what we get. How do we get here? I remember the late Archbishop Idaosa said something. He said, Elijah produced Elisha. Unfortunately, Elisha produced Gehazi. How did we get here? That the things you are saying, because now, once you are committed financially and in attendance, you are likely going to get a post. Once your attendance is regular and your finances is regular, they will give you an assignment. And so I tell people, you can get a caller, but you may not get a calling. It takes a tailor to get a caller, but it takes God to give a calling. So how did we leaders begin to commit spiritual things to people just because they were frequent in appearing in church and were financially committed? Forgetting that the spirit can fall on people who are outside the camp. People who don't fit into your definition can be called by God and the spirit can rest on them. How did we now think that those who meet our standards 
should hold offices and be promoted over time from deacon to assistant pastor to pastor to and how did we get here i'll show you a young man in the scripture his name is ephraim joseph his father had him in the book of Ex uh, sorry genesis chapter 41 his father had him in verse 52 his father called him ephraim he said because god has made him fruitful in the land of his affliction so where joseph had suffered God remembered him and gave him two sons. The first one was Manasseh, and the second one was Ephraim. The first one he called Manasseh. He said, because God has made him to forget the troubles he went through. And the second one in verse 52, he called Ephraim. He said, because God has made him fruitful. Sometimes, the things, the discomfort. I remember myself and Apostle Wale Aditubero. Remember the day from UCH Faith Clinic. After the 12 hour session, we walked from UCH to your house at Orita Challenge. We walked. We were happy. We didn't feel it. But protocols have, I don't know. I don't know how we got here, honestly. Maybe because I'm bivocational and I'm not consumed with all this paraphernalia of ministry, man of God. No, you can walk and serve God without all that. So Ephraim was named Ephraim because Joseph came to a point where all the pain he went through when he was growing and developing, God has wiped them away. Sometimes, our fruitfulness and our success begins to make us forget our roots. And we feel sometimes insulted when somebody referred to us that way. So he called this boy Ephraim because all things have passed away. God is doing a new thing. I am not the guy who you used to know. God has blessed me. And the parameter for divine approval has become material acquisition. And we as members have started to profile people, rank people, and place them based on their material acquisition and numbers of people who are not them. How did we get here? Now, what happened to Ephraim? This same Ephraim had a tremendous opportunity from his grandfather, Jacob. If you read chapter 48 in verse 5, you will see where Jacob was adopted, I mean, Ephraim was adopted by his grandfather to be equal to his uncles. The privilege of rising, success, and promotion. Watch it. Watch it. There are some, some enemies you can bring down overnight, like Goliath. Some enemies like Saul, you have to contend with for a long time. Saul is not going anywhere. He has to build character in David. That's a subject for another day. So now his grandfather adopted him equal to his uncles. So he got instantly raised up, promoted, and made one of his uncles. In fact, if you go back to the land of Israel in the Bible times, while Levite has no inheritance, Ephraim, the grandson, had a tribe and a land that he inherited. Because grace, by the turning of crisscrossing of the hand of his grandfather, laid on him in verse 14 of that same chapter 48. His father tried to correct him. You know the story very well. He, Joseph tried to correct grandpa and say, no, 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 no. The other way. You're laying the right hand on the younger one. Jacob said, I know what I'm doing. So now, See how success is coming. First, he was the son of fruitfulness, born in success and wealth. What the Yoruba man we call Abiola, Abisola, you were born in wealth. I hope there's no Abiola, Abisola listening to me. Sorry, it's not personal. So now the next stage of promotion he got was that he was made equal to his uncle, or older than his brother, his elder brother. Then, third level of success, he was raised to the status of his uncles. 
by the crisscrossing of hands. See what grace can do. See what the cross of Jesus can do for you and me. Subject for another day. And then in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 9, if you have the time, go through it. God called Ephraim his firstborn. So, born in wealth, promoted to be older than his elder brother, promoted and rose to be equal to his uncles. And now Ephraim is regarded as firstborn. Of course, you know, firstborn is not the same as born first. Born first is a biological hierarchy of who came first. But firstborn is a spiritual status. Oh, That's wow. why God called Israel my firstborn. Wow. That's why Manasseh himself, that's in Exodus chapter 4, if you remember, when Moses was sent by God to confront Pharaoh. He said, go and tell him, Israel is my firstborn. If you don't let him go, I'll strike your own firstborn. That's why in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus was also called firstborn. He's not born first, he's firstborn. Firstborn is a spiritual status. It is, you are, as a firstborn, you are due to inherit two-thirds of your father's wealth. It's called double portion. The father's wealth is divided into three and as the firstborn you get two thirds. That's what is double portion. Double portion does not mean hundred twice as much. It means two thirds when it's divided into three because now you are the wow. new daddy of the family and you should have extra to take care of everybody. Oh, wow. That was what Elisha was asking Elijah for. Give me a double portion. Make me your firstborn because there are other prophets in the house, who also knew by insight that their father was going to ascend. But he said, among all of them, give me a double portion. Make me your firstborn. So you got to understand why we're asking for double portion of anointing. It is not so that I perform more miracles. It's to take more responsibility. I hope you get that. So be careful what you ask for because if double portion comes, it does not mean double power. It means double responsibilities. Right. So you take care of your immediate fire. It makes you take care of your immediate family as a husband to your own children, your immediate family, your nuclear family, and you also take care of your extended family, your father's other wives, other churches, other bodies, other assemblies, and their children. Because mm. now you have a double portion. So when they come to meet you for financial help, you don't suck them as all of you send an honorarium to me. You take care of them because you have a double portion. You see the abuse and where we turn the gospel upside down. A double portion is a division of the inheritance into three portions. You, the firstborn, take two-thirds of it so that you take care of yourself, your immediate family, and the other one portion to take care of the others. So, so that's why you find that title used for more than two, three people. Israel is my firstborn. That's why in the world he treats Israel as his covenant people. And through them, salvation came. Because now they are taking care of the world. So to say, through the agency, and now the body of Christ is his firstborn because Jesus Christ is the firstborn of God. And through Jesus Christ, humanity is taken care of. So let's leave that for another day. So Ephraim was promoted, born in wealth, one, lifted to be older than his elder brother, a senior to his elder brother, if I may say so, two, equal to his uncles, three, and now made firstborn. Four, see a great, great privilege for rising. And then Ephraim in Hosea chapter 7 verse 8, he described Ephraim as a cake not turned. Bakers and cooks, you will know this. So you mix all the ingredients to bake your cake, put it in the oven, and you leave one side raw and the other side burnt. So how come these people are products? So the question is, if Ephraim is a cake not turned, who baked it? Who mixed the ingredients? Who put them in the oven? Who manufactured these ministers that we are seeing today? Wow. Who gave them the privilege to rise overnight? Who failed to teach them? You see, here is where we parents suffer. We manufacture the Frankenstein called millennial. 
Due apology to those of them who may be listening. Why? Because we feel that the pain and the sufferings our parents went, I mean, took us through. We exempt our children from them. And because of them, that's why we're working hard overseas and giving them all the toys and no responsibilities. Thank God for parents who are tough and hard on their children. I ask three questions if I want to know. There is no module for raising children that is absolutely right or absolutely wrong. But there are some leading indicators and lagging indicators that I look out for. One of that is what time does your children go to bed and rise in the morning? Do that. Second thing I ask parents is when your children fail, what consequences have you put in place for them? I talk to them. You remind me of Eli. He also talked to his sons. What happened? Third question I ask, if they are in pain and suffering, do you bail them out? That answers a lot. The same thing we have raised to spiritual sons and daughters who we have not baked properly. We mix the ingredients and put in the oven. We put them in place of position and power. They were able to take down one Goliath. Therefore, we promote them. And when King Saul to build character in them, chasing them every day through the wilderness, begins to build character, we come to deliver them. And so they are not baked. One part is burnt, the other part is raw. So I'm not here to throw stones, but I'm here to let us see that where quality is not controlled and it's not assured, it will cost more money to correct deficiencies. It will cost more time and man hours to correct deficiencies. And where that happens, what you have is a delay in many fronts. And the customers are not going to be happy with the product or with the job. We, we can't even commission. We can't hand over the project. Because it's, it's not ready. And if we do, it's going to fail. Mm. It's going to fail. Mm. The project manager told me something that happened. I, I, I just drove past where they build uh, aircrafts this afternoon. It's a, it's a plant where they build aircraft, Bombardier. If you ever heard of Bombardier. Mm -hmm. Bombardier is here in Toronto. They build wow. the aircrafts here. Wow. Bombardier aircraft. So I just mm. went through the place and I was watching an aircraft being tested. He just came out of the manufacturing plant and he was going. And the guy told me, he said, I wouldn't drive that. I wouldn't fly that plane. I don't trust. I said, well, well, if you <laughs> built it and you are sure of it, then fly it. Airbus built A310. First takeoff, they put senior executives inside. It crash landed. Some died. Excuse me, sir. Are we sure of the quality? Can we put grandma to be rich? Can we send Muslims there? Can we send Hindus there? Where did this gap come from? Now, having understood and admitted that the quality of the ministries and ministers and churches that are being born may not do the work. That's why the Catholic Church and the Methodist Church, we all run away from and the Anglican Church because we feel they are using prayer book, manuals, textbook to conduct service, reading sermons. That's where everybody's gone back to now because you're not even sure that they'll flow in the spirit to deliver a 10, 10, 30 minutes to someone without... You can't even show. So headquarter has to produce everything they would do for one hour. Which you, mm. when you were growing, you didn't do that. Because you, mm. if you let them flow, people will leave. Because they, they will tell you, I got nothing. And you know it. So... If we really want to go back to the root, I think our first thing is to repent. That, Father, we failed you. We did not hand over the button that was handed on to us. We took away the bones and the, wow. and the meat and gave them the milk. That what they know is the flamboyancy of ministry. They know the material. I was speaking with one denomination, one Pentecostal church pastor. And he was just whining to me this morning. And I said, sorry, I don't have the time. I'm, I, I have a day job. 
And he told me something. He said, the pressure of headquarters for number and uh, returns is, is, is making him go cuckoo. That these people have needs. And nobody's listening to him. I said, yes, because when we were raised, nobody was asking for your number and returns. But that's where we find ourselves today. And so they give you a manual on how to teach Sunday school, how to train workers, how to do this. But we had hands-on that produced quality men. Hands-on. Not textbook smart, but tool smart. I want us to look at the fact that that first recommendation here, I know we're going to continue today, I mean tomorrow and day after, is that I want to call the older generation to repentance. I say, God, we dropped the ball. We didn't pass it on as we were raised. We took away some vital elements in the curriculum. We showed them the product and the fanfare of ministry and not the rigor, the labor, the travail that goes with ministry. A lot of us can't tell our younger ones the story because we think they will judge us. But we want them to see our success because it will make us look good. We think the younger ones will think our friend is more anointed than us if he knows our struggles. But Jesus Christ did something that touched me. He calls the whole world, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now, when he took three people to the garden of Gethsemane, he told them a different story. He said, my heart is heavy. My heart is heavy. Do your sons and daughters know the heaviness of your hearts? Or they only know they come unto me, the miracles and the, the signs and wonders. Do they know your struggles? Do they know mm. your challenge? Mm. Do they know your pain? Do they know your failures? Mm. Or we mm. spiritualize it and say, oh, you have no right to t- talk ill of a man of God. You have no right. No, we're not talking ill of me. Mm. We're looking at where I failed, where I dropped the ball, where I made a mistake. Who doesn't mm. fail? Don't judge me because we sin differently. Ah. You might be struggling with anger or impatience and I'm struggling with finances. My struggle may be different. But are we ready to exchange and pour out our soul to these younger people and say, I am struggling in this area. It is possible for a man of God to suffer, to struggle. Paul was open and say, if... He said, I have prayed, God, take this thing away from me. And God said, Mm. you live with it. Mm. You will live with it. But Mm -hmm. my grace is sufficient for you. Friends, you can take down Goliath with one catapult, but you can't get Mm. rid of Saul with fall down and die. Mm. (laughs) Why? Because it's there to build character and keep us humble. Mm. So are we open to this? Have we trained them to know that the fanfare, flying a jet and now buying a helicopter, it's not, that's not ministry. Mm. Mm. Ministry is service to God and service to mankind. Wow, wow, correct. Mm. I'm not saying that's not good. I want one. If you have one, dash me. I'll sell it. I know what to do with the money. <laughs> All right. But my point here is, if we want to correct the deficiencies, let's look inward. Not mm. preach at those people for not doing the right thing. Let's mm. go back to the curriculum. Let's rebrand. Let's repent. Let's mm. think again. Mm. Let's look at the people. It's not just putting the curriculum and say, I've trained you now, you have a diploma. We do certificate, give you certificate, shake hand with you, take pictures and put it on Facebook. Mm. No. Let them sleep with you in the classroom on the floor. Wow. I sleep in the five-star hotel with you. Wow. Wow. Let them go without food mm-hmm. as you did when you had nothing. And mm-hmm. do the five-course meal when you had something. Mm. Let them know the, the, that it's not all sunshine or rosy. Don't be like my friend when his car breaks down. He will hide himself and call it, <laughs> what do you call it? He will call it, what do you call it? That was more. To come and meet him or a, fo- a church member. Come and pick me. My car is broken down. Why? He said he must not see a man of God in the, in the bus stop. 
Mm. What are you mm. training your people? What impression are you giving the younger generation about ministry? If that's mm. all they see and all they know. Mm. 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 The man of God must not be seen catching the train. <laughs> if you want me to come and preach, put me in a, in a five-star hotel. Mm. Send five vehicles to come and pick me in a convoy. Mm. That's the impression they have, and that's why they run ministry this way. That you, their father in the Lord, mm. can't see them in the days of their glory. Mm. 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 You can't even see them in the days of their glory. Mm. Why? Because materialism had become the yardstick, a number for mm. success. Mm. But John the Baptist, thank God for men like Smith Wigglesworth. The institutions wow. are not built after them today. But their impact will remain. Mm. Thank God for men like Rehan Bonke. Mm. And may I remind you that great institutions that have been built in America, all those universities you see, were one time Christian universities. What has happened to them over time? Mm. I want to challenge us. If mm. we want to go back to the roots, to first ask ourselves, where did I go wrong? Mm. Wow. Not where did they go wrong? Wow. Where did I go wow. wrong? Wow. I'll stop wow. at this point so that I give opportunity for others to speak. Mm. I hope in any way if I've annoyed you, I didn't say it right, please forgive wow. me. It's not personal. Wow. But I hope you will see my heart. That mm. I mean well. That mm. we'll see what we have produced doesn't match up with what we want. Wow. And the Ephraims that we have raised, they have not represented the Jacob that wrestled mm. with God until his mm. life was transformed and he Praise became Israel. God. Praise God. God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, Reverend Greg, this, wow. this is wonderful. This is, this is wow. This is wow. In fact, invariably, you are putting it forth to us as that what we produce, what we present before these coming generations, they are reading it upside down. That is it. Because after suffering comes the success or the prosperity that flows after hard labor. But the way we display it is what these new ones are seeing and seeing it to be the starting point for them, which is very wrong. And, and I'm praying by the grace of the living God, as many of us that are hearing now, I want to beseech you in the name of Jesus that we look into what the man of God is saying and try to minimize the way we parade or to present the prosperity or the outcome of our labor before this coming generation. But I know to the glory of God, like uh, Reverend Greg was coming from this side, I pray the new generation will be picking something here because that is the way Christ, the way Christ wants to take us to the glory 